Matt, here we are. It is, uh, I guess, time to make some kind of announcement. We've been teasing this on Weightlifting House for, I want to say, the best part of four months now. It's been the thing that I'm most excited about in my life. Uh, people have been guessing. They've been trying to work out what it is we're going to do. We've been dropping hints, but this is the episode that we're kind of going to do it. I imagine people are going to feel somewhat a bit shook seeing you sat here next to me. <laughs> we're not in California. We're in no. UK. We're in Birmingham, of all places, at Weightlifting House HQ. Uh, this is back in time from when you're watching this. This is us putting together the final stages of mm-hmm. what is going to be... And again, I'm being deliberately ambiguous still, but I've been saying it. I think it's... Uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think. I think it's the biggest change to weightlifting that there's been... I don't. I can't tell you when. Like since the press art rule was removed, <laughs> or I so I don't know. Like since they removed the cleaner press, I think it's going to have the biggest change on the way that people partake in the sport of weightlifting. Almost since CrossFit, you know what I mean? Like the way that people are involved in it, the way yeah. that people spend their day to day training lives. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I think I think it's certainly going to be a a step change in the way that training is done yeah, and, yeah. and delivered as well. Yeah. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So let's dangle a carrot a little bit longer. Let's okay. tease the audience a little bit longer. Let's talk about the fact that you disappeared for a while. Like you know, <laughs> I think last time we saw each other before this, other than the ridiculous number of Zoom calls that we've been having recently, mm-hmm. was probably twenty nineteen worlds. Yeah, in the back. Prior to that was uh, we went for burgers. Yeah. milkshakes yeah. in California, went to your gym, mm-hmm. um, and you were, I would say, the most popular weightlifting coach in the world at that point. <laughs> it's, it's probably true in terms of like views and stuff. Like I was That's going funny. back through YouTube just searching you because, you know, a little bit of stalking. Of course, yeah. Casual stalking. Um, and you discussing like something to do with training would have like 150,000 views. Wow. Like people were very interested in your thoughts. And then you kind of disappeared yeah. during the pandemic you know, competitions died away. So to some degree, that was, people expected that. Uh, do you yeah. want to talk about that though? Like, yeah. where, where did you go? So, you know, I mean, obviously like 2019, uh, 2019 Worlds and, and what happened post-2019 Worlds. Um, big picture, you know, there was a pandemic and... Was there? Yeah, there was, okay. a, there was a minor a minor issue there. <laughs> um, and, you know, that kind of like, it just really threw a wrench in a lot of stuff. But... But kind of leading up to that, um, you know, I had been in this situation and I was kind of saying this before, like I, I've been in situations like this in my life before where I was so as a, as a, as a professional or as an athlete or as a coach, so fixated on the outcome of what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, coaching Alyssa Ritchie, like every single day was the focus of like, this is the person like, mm-hmm. you know, eh, and this is a violation of my own, like, you know, my own teachings, which is, you know, to be process oriented. Yeah. But I was focused on like, every, yeah, yeah. yeah, every day is going to be like, what are we doing today? That's going to get us to the Olympics. What she are we was doing? Number 149 in the country and like going into worlds for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Was she, she was roughly sort of top four women in the country or like there or thereabouts. Like, it was, a, yeah, she was were, in the running for like Olympic qualification. There was a bunch of girls like yeah. right in the mix there. Um, and, you know, 2019, Pan Am, she had the highest 49 total ever, 190. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, awesome meet. And that was like this this kickoff to this, like, this year is going to be, this is we're going to do it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you remember, too, like, at the age of, like, 12 years old, I saw Naeem yeah, yeah. at the Olympics, yeah. like, do that that final lift. It was like a three-second clip. Like back in the 40s. Yeah, yeah, back in the 40s. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I was like, that's, I'm going to be in the Olympics someday, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm getting into this, like, place of, like, hey, this, everything is geared for this. Go to 2019 Worlds, terrible weight cut, and and just really, like, ends up being a, a, a shit meet, bad total, Roby points weren't good, got, you know, convinced to go to the Peru meet weeks after that, mm-hmm. cut for that, night before she's going to weigh in, you know, Demos drops the, the bomb on me and says... You know, uh, Jordan De La Cruz is going down to 49. Right. Yeah. Right. And so we're like, 
well, shit, like we, you know, you guys told us to be here and like this is like a meet that like will score points, but now it's worthless because yeah. we got to qualify for Pan Ams at right. American Open. So it was just like, you know, shit started falling apart. Mm-hmm. Obviously, had we just done great at Worlds, it would have been fine. Right. But, uh, you know, I'm focused on this whole thing of like, we're going to, you know, every single day, every single meet, everything is about the Olympics. And you go to, go to the American Open and, and, you know, for those of you guys that remember, I mean, wafting years, it's probably, you know, a lifetime ago yeah. in internet years. But, uh, you know, didn't didn't make the total, so she didn't make the Pan Am team there. But then pandemic happens and there's a thought of maybe a second comeback, maybe yeah, some yeah, time yeah. off. But everything, you know, you can remember like what was March 2020, like yeah, yeah, everyone's yeah. thoughts back then were very different. We didn't realize yeah. it was going to be what it is. Um, where we live too, like in Northern California, like we still have like mask mandates, like yeah, yeah. It's, California is yeah. going heavy on it. Yeah. yeah. They leaned into it really hard. So, you know, things were just really different and mm-hmm. Alyssa retired kind of early 2020 and a lot of the juggernaut team aged out, you right. know, they were all kind of on the older, you know, mm-hmm. older side for weightlifters. And so the team kind of dissolved and it kind of was this thing where, you know, Hindsight's twenty twenty. I knew that I probably needed to be recruiting younger people and bringing yeah, more yeah, people yeah. in. But, you know, there was this fixation of, like, getting to the Olympics is yeah, the thing yeah. that's most important. And, you know, I, I was kind of telling the story. Like, the analogy I had was, like, when I was – the first time I was trying to squat 700 pounds, yeah. I had I had just gotten into this place of, like, all I was doing was squatting. I mean, I, I guess I was benching and deadlifting, but, like, just mm-hmm. for the sake of it. And – I, I, you know, like every day was the same thing. It was put 120 kilos in the bar, mm-hmm. 120, 170, 220, 250, 270, you know, 300, miss 320. And like, like, like clockwork is yeah, every yeah, day yeah, the same yeah. thing. And, you know, it was like, this is ridiculous. But uh, I ended up missing it 18 times. And the, the 18th time was the second attempt at the meet. Yeah. And then I made it on the third. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't even know exactly how I made it. It was just mm-hmm. like some fluke, sheer force of will. But I walked away from that experience thinking to myself, how can I get to, you know, 710? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way this is the strategy that's going to take me there. Right, right. And what I did then was I I changed my training philosophy. And I went back and I contacted different people. And I ended up yeah, starting training. Your training model changed. Changed like, dram- dramatically. Like, yeah. yeah. Abhijay of Desheko is about as polar opposite as you can get. Yeah. And it went from like brute force, you know, your training, uh, the sum of the parts, it does not equal the whole, you know, it's grossly, <laughs> grossly yeah, yeah, larger. Yeah. And, you know, to, to learning from Sheiko where it was like, you know, hey, Great training should produce exceptional results that are above and beyond what you what it seems like you put in. Yeah. Right? Each piece should add up to something more than that. What did you say the numbers were yesterday? You were saying like what you hit in training and then what you hit in competition. Yeah, so there like the one of the first means I did training that way with a very different like submaximal kind of mm-hmm. Soviet style training. Um, I did like a triple at 250 yeah. in the gym and then did 312 in the meet. Yeah. And it was just like, it was, it felt like an empty bar. Right. Yeah. And it was just like, this is clearly the, the, the way I need to do this. I just got this picture of, you know, Louis Simmons when he always says, there has to be a better way. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like that moment where you're like, yeah, this is the better way. Yeah. So I, I say that, I tell that story because I equate it like that was the moment I'd made that change. And, you know, post, post 2019 worlds with Alyssa as a coach, I mm-hmm. didn't make that change. And right. I, I, I kind of got, you know, burned out on on what I had done because it was like such a it was such a, a event of like, you know, everything is going to lead to this thing that yeah. you've been trying to get to, you know. Yeah. Um but what it did actually is it gave me this ability to kind of reset and take a big step back from from what I was doing mm-hmm. because you know, what I was delivering to Alyssa as a coach was so detail oriented and so focused um the calculations and the and the programming and everything was just like there was so much of that going on and that like it was just like i couldn't i couldn't scale that to more people so i couldn't take this information and be like okay like you know i'm gonna give it to like i mean i was doing it for like maybe the top you know 10 people on the team Mm -hmm. but i wasn't able to do that with anybody else yeah and it wasn't sustainable as as a coach because you just you know, if you coach five people or ten people, sure, but um, you know you couldn't you couldn't grow beyond that because you don't know. You know, it's like once you get beyond a certain point, it just becomes mm-hmm. too difficult. Um, you know, and so that that kind of led to like you know we started I started a project with 
with Juggernaut, the Juggernaut wafting AI, uh, which really was was not fantastic. It was a, essentially, in my mind, a proof of concept or a prototype. Mm-hmm. Looking back at it, but it was done, you know, was done with right intentions, but it didn't. It just didn't turn into anything that was that worked. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you were surprised by the lack of. I don't know. I, I don't want to say anything that's not quite right, but like you were surprised by how not good it was. Yeah. It, <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> like, yeah, it was a, it was a situation where it was like, there was a lot of like, you know, you got to imagine that, like, think about, uh, you know, think about any, think about any project. That's, that's the first time someone's mm-hmm. doing it. Yeah. yeah. You know, the first shot's not going to work and that's, that should be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, you and know, that's and, fine. yeah, that's not the problem. Right. It's iterations. It's, yeah. yeah. You got to iterate over and over again to get mm-hmm. something. But, Additionally, what it really was, was that was a program. And what I think really, like in my experience over the years of coaching and seeing people train and being involved in gyms and and knowing coaches, like there's just a sort of, there's a, there's a difficulty in getting somebody to go from being like a, a, you know, a person in the gym, like example would be like, okay, I've got a lifter comes in my gym and years ago, I would sit there in front of everybody and watch every single rep and yeah. tell them every single cue. Mm-hmm. And what would happen is these people would become super dependent on me. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't do a lift without me. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't function unless I was instructing every single mm-hmm. thing. Um, and so, you know, like no program can, can no, 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 you know, training plan or program is going to solve that. That's yeah, a problem yeah, yeah, of yeah. the lifter not being autonomous. Yeah. The lifter doesn't have the ability to look at their training or look at their lifting and, and objectively like quantify, okay, or qualify it. Like this mm-hmm. is, you know, this is good lift. This is a bad lift. You know, there, it's a really a jump actually. Like when you go from like a, a beginner to an intermediate, mm-hmm. you, you know, and then kind of breach into that advanced level. It's like, you see the differences when a beginner does lifting, they have a bunch of different mistakes or mm-hmm. they're unaware of what's going on. An intermediate has some, some mistakes and they may be aware, may not be mm-hmm. aware but what separates them and allows them to continue progressing is that they have this introspective ability to like start self assessing their lifting mm-hmm. and grasp like, okay, this makes sense. Like this is good. That's bad. And, and kind of regulate their training. Mm-hmm. You can give somebody that at that level, a program and you're like, okay, I kind of know what this is supposed to take yeah. me to. And a millimeter forward in the pull, they can feel, mm-hmm. and it's very hard as a coach to see it. You know, right. like self coaching right. becomes more of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know that's that's something that like was was something I couldn't you couldn't do with with the program. You couldn't do by just saying, okay, hey, we're going to take this and here's your sets and reps. Mm-hmm. Um, and how do you teach that? Right, it was something that was really difficult to do. Uh, and then additionally, like having having remote lifters and all of my coaching basically post 2016 was you know predom- predominantly remote. Mm-hmm. I coached five American record holders total and. Um, you, you were know. killing it. Yeah, you was, really uh, were killing it. I was it. working a lot. I was oh, working God. hard. Three of those people were coached entirely remote. Yeah. Kiana Welch, I didn't even, I had only done maybe one or two training sessions with her in person mm-hmm. before she actually went and broke that snatch record uh, in 2017. Which presumably requires a system to be put in place that allows you to not be there and the athlete knows what to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. And it's, it's like, I think, you know, and maybe I didn't get the time, but like there's a, there's an education that happens. A coach isn't just somebody who instructs you. Like, you know, mm-hmm. the example of me early on in my career is like just sitting there telling people what to do and how to do it isn't coaching. Mm-hmm. That's just, you know, you're just like the guy who's telling, you know, it's a form check, right? right. Um, and so I wasn't doing what a lot of great coaches did, which was educate people and like bring them to the the stage of like, hey, here's how to here's how to train, here's how to assess these things, and here's how to manage. It. Yeah. Set. yeah. With remote coaching, I got I was forced into that, mm-hmm. and I had to be creative about building programs and designing things and cueing people and instructing mm-hmm. in a way that you know like gave them the ability to manage their training, but also you know you could leave it open-ended and say, okay, you know, we'll do 10 singles and go up to maximum. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But that's not really a training program, right? right? That's Mm -hmm. an op. You're just kind of giving them like a blank slate. Right. And, and sure you could write a program like that, but Mm -hmm. what's the value, right? You're not bringing any value because you're not giving them anything that's individualized. You're Mm -hmm. just saying, Hey, if you feel good on any one day, just go up to maximum. 
And the problem with that is some people's personality is that, oh, it's a license to just, you know, do whatever I want to do. Um, So that was another like major kind of downfall of the idea of like creating a training program for somebody is that you're not giving them the ability. You're not, you're not monitoring the training process close enough Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, it looks like you're going to be ready for a PR Mm -hmm. right now. If you're coaching somebody and you're doing, you know, video analysis every day and texting them every day and watching every lift. Sure. That's the same as being in person, right? There's still a lack of rep or at least set to set sort of, responsive right. changes that you don't get even if you are doing that like right. it ha- it's unless you're sat there on zoom watching the athlete right. there's nothing really that changes within the set unless yeah. the athlete's educated but then you become the you become the unscalable the, coach yeah well you yeah. become the guy who's sitting there in front of it right it's yeah, just yeah, like yeah, a yeah. zoom yeah. call or or in mm-hmm. person and so that was like another like major you know it's a major component that doesn't really exist that's kind of like you know you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're trapped in that mm-hmm. um giving people the ability to to say hey right now looks like a time that we need to test this mm-hmm. looks like a time that like this is what a coach does when you're training in the gym and you come in and I'm watching you like oh man like your your hang snatches have looked really good recently and right. today looks really like it's probably going to be a good day let's work up mm-hmm. um that was something i learned as an athlete that was difficult to to get across in like discussing training principles. It isn't necessarily like a principle of training to like, you, you know, max out when you feel good. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my coach, Steve Goff used to say, you know, like strike while the iron's hot. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's a, that's a thing that I find very beneficial in training mm-hmm. and it, it gives you, it gives you, you know, that feedback. Mm-hmm. Sure. You can create programs that, you know, whatever, work up to a single every day or something like that. But you're, again, it's just, you're creating a, open-ended thing that can turn into something else so the ability to sort of give this predictive and you know predictive kind of training but also like establish a a method of training that allows for good amounts of data to be tracked like i was doing with Alyssa, Mm -hmm. uh, and then turn that into something useful at some point yeah so data's being collected and it's predictive uh and it's sort of informing decision making right yeah 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 Um, and so, you know, those, those two main things, you know, were really like, they were lacking in, in, in the, the JTS stuff. It was, and and rightfully so, because it was, in my opinion, very much like an initial assessment, an initial, you know, prototype try. Um, you know, and so, so that was like really like a big, a big like point for me over those last couple of years of being kind of. Burn, out. Yeah, yeah, burned out's a good term. I think I think a lot of stuff like you know you're burned on that. You're also in this place of like you know, there's a pandemic and there's yeah. like competitions were like this up in the air thing. It was really weird for me. The idea, the funny thing is like it was really weird for me being a totally remote coach. Mm-hmm. And then like they had nationals in yeah. a remote situation, yeah, yeah. and I was just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, yeah, why yeah. would I do remote nationals? Yeah. But like all of my career as a coach is all this, you know, this sort of like remote thing. Um, and so, you know, it was just like, there's a long time. Even now, it doesn't feel like I went to nationals in 2021 in Detroit. And it was like, you know, it was very different. It still felt like nothing had really kind of like, uh, you know, come around. Like yeah. we still were in that place. Yeah. Another thing that was a real bummer during that time for me, some of the athletes I had and, uh, you know, they... Some of them, you know, moved on and, and wanted to do other stuff or had to move or whatever. Uh, and some of them, like, got, you know, there were some bad situations. Uh, it was challenging for them to find training and mm-hmm. challenging for things to go. Um, and I'm sure a lot of coaches and people experienced that yeah. kind of thing. But, you know, it kind of just forced me to take this step back and to evaluate those kind of things and evaluate the, the process of that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how do I create super individualized programming that is detail-oriented on a level that, you know, is is maximizing the knowledge I have and actually applying it. Right. Not just broad template, here you go, take it and do something with it. Yeah, yeah. But like, hey, here's real individualized training program. Because, yeah. you know, if you remember, like, between 2018, uh, prior to 20, between 2018 Worlds and 2018 American Open, you know, the training systems I had used with Alyssa were... I would say rudimentary up to worlds. They, right. they were okay. Yeah. 
uh, they were principle based and they worked, but they were they were not individualized well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then from 2018 Worlds to 2018 American Open, she added like 12 or 13 kilos to her total. Yeah, yeah. And it was a remarkable change when I had taken the time to actually lay out the details of what made her individual, mm-hmm. what was really going to benefit her, uh, you know, from multiple perspectives, like exercise selection, volume, intensity, you know, frequency, these kind of things that were like small details. But when you when you check off the box on five of those details, yeah. it's that same shake of thing. It's right, like yeah. the sum of the parts suddenly becomes, you know, mm-hmm. the ball. I always get it wrong. The, the sum of the parts is less than, less than the, the whole. The yeah. whole, yeah. The whole is greater than the sum of the That's parts. That's the way. <laughs> and so, you know, that would, to me was like, okay, this is, this is awesome, but yeah, yeah, I can't yeah, do yeah. anything with this beyond three people, five mm-hmm. people. And then me also, you know, taking the time to consider those other two factors, right? How do we get, how do I get someone who's, either a beginner or an advanced person to, to develop the skills to analyze their training Mm -hmm. and, you know, the process of like, how do you go about doing that? How do you actually like get yourself involved in the process Mm -hmm. where you're not just, you're not just sort of saying, Oh, I missed. Why did I miss? You're assessing like, what is the quality of this lifting? You know, what, how can I quantify this in a way that's usable to me? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with the decision? I, you know, the result of this lift, how do I use that decision to influence the next lift? Yeah. Or how yeah, do I, yeah, you yeah. know, and then, uh, you know, the other component of, uh, uh, well, I was lost train of thought, but, uh, using data to the data, right. Yeah. So, so tracking yourself, tracking the data and actually taking that stuff and doing something with it. That's, yeah. that's worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I got into a place with Alyssa where I was tracking every single thing. Yeah. And it's, it's cool. Mm. it's cumbersome and it's a question of like, you know, as a person keeping track of those things and trying to draw conclusions from them is difficult. Mm. And you can easily get yourself into a place where you're like, Oh, you know, like I think it's because X, Y, and Z, you know, this is going to be better, Mm -hmm. but you don't know for sure. And so you're stuck in a place where, you know, you, you obviously as a coach, you go back to first principles and say, Hey, what, you know, what is the fundamental thing that's driving results right now? Um, but also, can I use these other influence, you know, these other yeah. factors to do something with that and, and make an informed decision for the next block of training or the next month or the next week or day? Yeah. And first um, principles thinking has been to some degree the backbone. Well, it had to be the starting point of what we're doing here. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have to start from a point of, you know, what are the, the basic, most undeniable, essentially principles and laws that you can't violate? What, yeah. And how do you apply those principles in a way that makes sense? Mm-hmm. And then taking those principles and applying them in a way that it filters through these other things mm-hmm. to deliver, you know, exceptional training and deliver something that's actually like above and beyond just like, oh, I wrote the best program in the world. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've all done that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my, my, my view, you know, after having gone through these experiences is that I'm always wrong, mm-hmm. right? It's that I'm trying to be a little bit less wrong each time, yeah. right? Um, I didn't obviously come up with that, but I like that, I yeah, like yeah, that yeah, statement, yeah. right? Because yeah. it, it makes sense to have that perspective of not like, why is this right, but why is this wrong? Yeah, but it's and like then, chess. It's like right. there is the perfect game, which is why, you know, it's a closed game. It's a, it's a closed system. There's the perfect game. And you just become less wrong over time. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, that's where essentially I spent, you know, a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of energy going back to the drawing board and redoing what I had done. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. It led me here to Wafting House and you can buy my ebook for 29. No, no, <laughs> you can buy the Max Ata NFT selection. The NFT is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Board Ape Ata edition. Um, so what I was going to do was talk a little bit about Juggernaut and Weightlifting House, but I actually wonder if it makes more sense to say what it is that we're doing. Yeah. And then get into that. Well, yeah. So I don't, as of earlier this year, end of, end of last year, um, I I got to a point, you know, where it, this is kind of the end of, of the journey where I got really essentially burned out on it. Uh, and I, you know, had a, a well, you've had heart. like hundreds of athletes as well. Well, not yeah. hundreds, but like over. A, you had like a lot of athletes. There was a point where I had over, yeah, over a hundred athletes I was working with, 
Um, probably some of them are watching and like, fuck, that's why he never responded. <laughs> um, then the ones that I still have, don't worry, I'll, I'll get to your response. Yeah. Um, no, but like, you know, it was like getting to a point where it's like, and that was like combined with the gym and whatnot. Right. So it just got to a point where like I wasn't doing, yeah, I wasn't going forward in the way I wanted to. Um, and, you know, kind of feel like I was letting down my initial like younger self and getting into this. Like mm-hmm. if you're not doing an exceptional job, um, you know, you're, you're not, you're not doing it for the right reasons. Kind of, it's kind of right around, um, I don't remember when it was October, mm-hmm. my 2020, coach, 2021 last uh, year. So October yeah. last year, my, my coach passed away. Yeah. He passed away pretty suddenly. He was 75. Mm. And that was a really hard, that was really hard for me because he was like a, a father. You right. know, he was like a father figure. And, um, you know, the coaching, training and these things were one thing, but it was like the things that he instilled to me that, that I didn't want to look back and say, you know, I, I, yeah, I didn't do a rider. I got burned out and I quit. All right. You know, the, any of these things. And, you know, over the last like, several months I thought about that a lot and so you know kind of wrapping this up trying to get to a point is like that was inspiring to say I should leave Juggernaut and you know so I left Juggernaut and decided to do this on my own and actually go about the process of like how do I make something that's actually exceptional that's not gonna be a one and done thing yeah where okay we've built this thing and it's, it's great. And I'll see you guys later, you know, make sure the PayPal goes through. Um, it's the kind of thing where it's like every time I learn something new, the ability to, to improve the system is there. Yeah. Every time, you know, you talk to a different coach who says, Hey, like here's something that we discovered works really well. Mm -hmm. That's part of it now. And as my training, you know, logic improves, so does, you know, the thing. the thing we're building, <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's the kind of it's the kind of satisfying process that got me basically reinvigorated into doing this. Yeah, because I was, you know, I mean, it was a lot of things that hit, but it was just like, you know, there was a moment there where it was like, uh, you know, being uh, in weightlifting oblivion, where yeah. you're like, I don't know what to go from here. So I think there were probably two things that brought you back to that level of the passion and excitement that's obvious now. Like since you arrived in Birmingham, we've just been like talking about weightlifting, what we do, yeah. sort of the history, what our thoughts on the future. And it's it's a it's what you've been working on, what we've been working on, and realizing how much of an impact we can have to improve weightlifters' lives, basically. Yeah. But then also to some degree doing stuff with us where we're like in the middle of it, in the in the thick of weightlifting. Everyone here is passionate and excited and it's like the coming together of you and weightlifting house yeah. i feel is in it, like it's intense like it's big for the sport yeah one of the things that like the reason i reached out to you and the reason i like weightlifting house is because so it's funny i actually read your bio about why you call it weightlifting house oh, yeah. i just thought you were you know this is some bullshit marketing right <laughs> um, and maybe the story is bullshit but it was essentially <laughs> like not. someone called it a weightlifting house this yeah. is a weightlifting house there's actually and, an article about the weightlifting house oh really because we reached like the university tabloids as like the guys at the gym who are just always lifting weight and like you know wow. it's like they know their way around a snatch and it was very like weirdly sexual but yeah, okay there's proof of it so yeah, in the papers sexual thing aside <laughs> um it's so funny because it was like that's the same story i had uh when we were God, when i was like probably early 20s and it was me and two other lifters mm-hmm. and Goff would drive from the city of Ennis to Bozeman to train us. Yeah. It's a 55 minute drive both ways. Mm-hmm. And he would drive out, you know, he, he'd claim he's going to drive out once a week and he'd drive out six days a week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he put, he put like his heart and soul into it every single day. And we were too. We were so focused on like being weightlifters. Oh my God. And you and I were talking about this the other day in the car, like, when you when you are not talented and you're not strong, but you think like, oh yeah, because all you're all you're surrounded by is like yeah. excellence. Like it's I was pointing out, you know, before the podcast, the the photographs of all of the top lifters in here are people that I watched and looked at when I was training with golf, yeah. which were all like, you know, people that were, you know, done lifting in the eighties. Yeah. 
And it was like, yeah, you know, got Alexei up there, yeah. we've got you yeah, know, Solodov, Shabarov, like yeah. all these people that you're just like, no one knows who they are now. But that was you're surrounded by. So as a, this like yeah. talentless kid growing up in Montana, you're like, okay, like, you know, uh, like, yeah, snatching 175 as a 90. Like, yeah, I guess I that's what totally you did. I totally thought yeah. that was what you did. Yeah. And I, th- I, I would have put, I know it sounds ridiculous. I almost would have put my life on the line to say that <laughs> I believed that I would do that. Imagine what it's like too when there's like, I was a very strong squatter. Yeah, yeah. And so there was this one thing too that you're like, well, I mean, I guess I could probably, because like I'm pretty good at squatting. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah. that, like, you know, how many millions of times I like yeah. went to like a, you know, the Queensland weightlifting oh, page, I love that page yeah. and typed in my best front squat and like, oh, I should be clean and drinking 210. Yeah. It's and like, you're well, like, I can definitely snatch yeah. 65% of my back squat. Yeah. So if I just back squat 300. Yeah. It's the secret. No one else knows this trick, yeah. but you just, yeah. <laughs> But like, you know, so you're like stuck in that. And it's like, my, my thing with it is like, you are that guy. You've been to that point. Yeah. And the whole idea of bringing weightlifting closer to, to athletes and to coaches and bringing it to people. Perhaps, yeah. I wish like when I was younger, there was a lot of those lessons taught to me. The lessons I learned were, were very different than the lessons that make a, an exceptional weightlifter, mm-hmm. right? We weren't, yeah. you know, it wasn't about like, flawless technique of this net no. the things that i learned were were about you know hard work and, and it was brute force yeah yeah a, a great story that's totally a tangent but i, I want to say this because it's like i i've never i don't know if anyone else will say this story because so there was this guy that was one of the three of us that trained yeah. in the in the garage with us and you know his personality was kind of funny it was like like a John North light. If right, anyone, yeah. if, all right, he, he was a very nice guy, but, uh, you know, he was, you know, kind of a, a blowhard, you know, yeah. my apologies, John, but like very, very like he would talk about like, I'm going to go on a mission. Like I want to go on missions one day. I want to yeah, be a yeah. spy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so this guy, you know, he's a roommate and like, he was like a bouncer and like, he's just this guy who's like fumbling around with weightlifting. And, uh, the story goes, I left, I had moved from then. I actually moved to California by then. Um, he kept saying this to Steve. And mm. Steve a, a, you know, a, was a, a Marine and ex-Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They took him to the Navy recruiter <laughs> and kicked him into the office and made him sign up. And so you're like, this guy is like not the guy that's going to succeed here. Right. He... He had Goff calling him every day. So he signed up and with his, like, you know, basically signed up, went to Bud's. Mm-hmm. And, like, what he'd done, he basically graduated Bud's first in his class, then oh, wow. went on to become, like, SEAL of the Year, then went on to become a sniper, and oh then become God. a sniper instructor. Yeah, yeah. And this guy, I actually just saw him at the funeral. Like, the transformation from, like, here's this kid who's, yeah. like, kind of just, you know, bouncing around. To this, you know, like what they pushed him to do mm-hmm. is just like, you know, amazing. amazing. Those were the lessons that Goff taught us. Yeah. Those kind of like, you can do anything you want to do. You can you can be whatever it is you want to be yeah. if you work as hard as possible. Right. Um, and I, I tell a story because I think it's a good story to get across. Like, those are the lessons that were great. But as a weightlifter, as a kid, I would have loved to have had <laughs> yeah. a little more of a like, let's add that in with the... Like, give me something exceptional that can, like, yeah. improve what I do, yeah. you know? Train deliberately. Right. Follow a program that isn't just more effort equals right. more results. So. Right. And it's, you get sucked into that. You yeah. get sucked into the idea that, like, things are simple and that, you know, oh, it's just basic. Oh, you just yeah. go in and yeah. you max out every day, right? Yeah. Like, if you just train harder, you'll get there. Yeah. And, and it sounds so simple. It's such a, you know, we talked about this Bulgarian training. Like, it just sounds like the most romantic idea. Like, oh, well, they just train harder than you. Yeah, yeah. It's well, like, I mean, I did similar to you. I, I never did like the seven max squat sessions a day, but I did, you know, I fir- hurt, first hurt my wrist trying to clean, I want to say 120 or 125. This was year, this is like six years ago. Uh, so I couldn't, I couldn't snatch or clean. So every day for six months, seven days a week, I'd come in in the morning, I'd back squat to max, mm. then I'd do four doubles as heavy as possible. Then I'd come back in the evening, I'd back squat to max, but with a belt. And then do like four doubles or three fives or something back off. Yeah. I did that every single day, six months. Back squat went up by 20 kilos. And then the first day I pulled on a bar, I cleaned 140. I got yeah. like a 16 kilo PR and it was just like, 
Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, you and then know, you just kept and then repeating you that over and over again. And you but then made, you buy into it. Yeah. You start believing like, okay, this really is a thing. Yeah. And then it just gradually wears you down and you can't, you know, you can't continue on. But Yeah. And that's, that's one of those things that like, how do you, how do you, you know, the irony is that like for us having done that, you take those lessons into life somewhere else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the guys that weren't capable of being exceptional lifters, right? Yeah, yeah. And maybe, you know, I'm sure maybe you have success in something else or you have, you know, some talent, but like... It doesn't go away. Yeah. It's somewhere. It's the yeah. journey, right? Yeah. It's a lot like what Goff did with, with you know, my friend. Like, it's the ability to, to take those hard-earned lessons and turn them into something else. Mm-hmm. But then also, like, okay, how do you build something that's useful to people? Yeah. Right. How do you actually take what you've learned? You know, how many fucking mistakes have I made coaching? Right. Like yeah. I remember listening to an interview with, uh, might've been Vladimir Safanov. Yeah, yeah. And he talked about like, Oh, well the first, you know, as you're a beginner coach, you're going to ruin someone's career. Like you're probably gonna fuck it up. Like, cause you, you know, and it's like this hilarious wow. thing. Cause you're like, Oh shit. Then you're like, yeah, I mean, that's true. Like yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. sure that I've like, you know, screwed up someone's lifting yeah. career. Cause I didn't know what I was doing early on. Yeah. Um, and Waxman talks about it a lot, right? Same. Like, you know, if you if you coach somebody as a beginner, like you have to be the most advanced coach yeah, to coach yeah, yeah. kids because yeah. you need to be yeah, he does talk about that. excellent in that. And yeah. so, yeah, how do you take all those lessons? How do you take all that information? How do you apply a process and say, this is now something we're going to make that's like way better than just, you know, in my opinion, like the same shit you're selling everybody else, which is like, here, do do this. Yeah. And it works and it's great because I said it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's nothing that grows. There's nothing living about it. And you end up in a position where it's like you just rename it a different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sell it again. Yeah. You've always spoken about that. Add yeah. extra ER on the end of whatever adjective you're using to make the program even better than the one before. Right. Uh, right. Should we just say it? Sure. So we've been working on uh, what is going to be the biggest game changer in programming that and this, this this sounds like hyperbolic, but it's really not. Probably the biggest change in programming that weightlifting's ever seen. Um, weightlifting AI is is what we're working on. Weightlifting AI with Weightlifting House and Max Ata. It is individualized. It is responsive, rep to rep, set to set, uh, exercise to exercise, week to week. It's constantly changing, learning more about you, uh, improving your technique, improving your strength. Uh, and it's proven by these, you know, basically first principles thinking as well as sort of the principles of weightlifting, yeah. uh, which you've been able to focus on. It's it's unbelievable, you know, even now when we talk about it, because your understanding of it is so in-depth, It, I learn new things every time. I go home and I can't explain to Charlotte how amazing this thing is. Yeah. Like gen- I genuinely, it's, it's the thing, and this is what you and I said. It's a thing because we're quite similar in our histories. Yeah, starting out in weightlifting, it's a thing I desperately needed. Yeah, it yeah. would have taken over my life. It it takes into account what you're good at, what you're not good at. It learns things about you. It learns things about the specific phases of each lift. You know, it it has a hierarchy of exercises to correct an individual phase of each lift. It changes based on your exertion of each rep. It's just constantly optimizing yeah. for you. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's gonna be it's it's something I'm really proud to, to have have worked on. So I have you know, like I mean, I'm in depth want to talk, but I, I I brought in a developer and partner with someone to actually like where it's an actual app. Yeah. So yeah, it's, there's it's not this is not a this is not a PDF. It's not a. It's not an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, it's not an ebook. There's an actual app coming yeah. out, the Wave Thing app. Um, it's it's something I'm very happy, very very happy with, very proud of, yeah. and. Yeah, I guess I don't know how much more we want to divulge in this video, but I mean, I I'm happy to go into it a bit more. Obviously, we're going to have sure. an episode where we almost put it under attack to prove yeah. how detailed this thing is, and we're going to bring probably someone like Josh in to do that, uh, and then we can do you know YouTube videos on the various principles, which which will come out over the next few weeks, months. But I think a little bit more into at the very least, like how does it like. W- not how does it work. That's too open-ended a question. Why is it that we need to individualize a program from the get-go? Almost? Yeah, so so it's the kind of thing like I was talking about in my experience 
when when you look at the difference between something that is suboptimal for somebody versus something that is optimized, the difference is small, right? Mm-hmm. And it appears small on the surface that, okay, if you're doing um, your example of your squatting, right? Mm-hmm. You did a, an enormous amount of squatting. Yeah. And really what you did is you basically just drove the ceiling of your maximum recoverable training volume up really, really high. Yeah, yeah. So you could tolerate a lot of training, mm-hmm. right? Generalized training, right? Just the ability to do a, a huge amount of work. Mm-hmm. But you also, with that, drug your minimum effective training volume up very high. Mm-hmm. And so while that that garnered you, you know, 16 kilos in PR in the mm-hmm. clean, um, it... Took also, a long time to PR again. Right. Yeah. Because what happens is then you're stuck in this place of you've got to do this much to get yeah. better. Yeah. And you can only recover from this much. Mm. And if you drop below this level of threshold, your squat strength will decline yeah. and you're going to kind of be in this place of like it's difficult to make progress. I did the same thing to myself. I did right. so much training early on in a way that was, you know, excessive that it drove these numbers to points where if I didn't train hard, I couldn't maintain my results. Mm-hmm. And then you're you're stuck in a place where you want to bring your snatch and clean jerk up, which matters, yeah. but you have to maintain this enormous amount of training volume in your squat mm-hmm. because that's the mechanism by which you're trying to drive these numbers up. It was like my injury threshold lay below my minimal effective dose. Yeah. And so I could never hit it. Yeah, so you're stuck. I just got hurt every time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and you're trapped. And so... It's, it seems like, well, it's insignificant to say, okay, well, you know, dial it in. Well, that's great. You can dial it in for yourself with experience or we can draw on data and say, okay, where, where are these boundaries? What is the optimal range of training you should be in? And, you know, lucky for us, like we, we have this available to us, but also we have fantastic starting points. A lot of data was collected yeah. by the Soviets. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot collected by the Chinese. Yeah. We also have a lot of empirical data we've used. Mm-hmm. And so you can be in this place of saying, you know, we don't have to be absolutely 100% correct day from, from the start. From day one, right. we have to be 90 plus percent on target. Yeah. And we figure out where that where we are based on the boundaries of what happens. Right. And so we sort of the interface allows the athlete right. to say what happens in a very clever way. Like, so right. the app is then learning. How did that way feel? Do we now do we now take you up for the next right. set because the previous sets look good? Do we drop you back and it's able to sort of manage fatigue and then impact proper decision making? Yeah, you know, and kind of going forward. One of my kind of like I love the idea of first principles in that like we only want to draw on things that exist within the sport. You you theoretically shouldn't need lots of external things to participate in weightlifting. Yeah. The number one most important principle is specificity. So if all you did, if you had two athletes and all one did was weightlifting competitions and all the other one did was they had access to, you know, uh, they could just squat or they could do five exercises but not weightlifting, Mm -hmm. you'd always choose a weightlifting one because it's specific. The most specific, yeah. And so part of the first principles approach is that we use elements of competition to actually inform the system of what's going on Mm -hmm. and obviously you'll see in other videos how it works but but the idea that you know you're you're essentially finding a way to give people an ability to auto-regulate training Mm -hmm. based on how they would in competition yeah Um, you're giving people the tools to actually not even the tools you're, you're forcing people to take an analytic approach to their training to the way they perform sets and reps in a way that is unique to them if you're the kind of person who's overly aggressive, the system will play into that. If you're the kind of person who's, you know, hypercritical, mm-hmm. the system plays into that. Yeah. Um, and it's a very simple and elegant solution, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, eliminating the need for understanding complex things in order to work the system mm-hmm. is, you know, we, we've done a great job, in my opinion, of doing that. Yeah. There aren't things that you would look at and be like, oh, shit, like, I need to learn how to do this. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's so, it's so intuitive. like intuitive, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like, yeah, it, it's, it's, I get very excited about it because it's the kind of thing where you're, it's <laughs> like, a, so, I've been bursting at the seams yeah, for months wanting to tell people. I'm it's just... like a kid, but it actually loves you. No, um, <laughs> it's like my kid, but he actually loves me. No, it's like a, it's like a, a kid, a kid that like, Hey, this is like a baby that you built and it's like, this thing is getting better and better and it's cooler and cooler. Um, but yeah, so I kind of got off track there, but the, the idea is like we want to instill, okay, first principles as a foundation for building training programs. Yeah. 
individualization as the the hallmark of you know why this exists is because subtle changes, subtle differences can make huge impacts later on down the road. Over time, yeah. Right? If you are doing too much training or too little, or you're picking the wrong exercises, mm -hmm. one of the major frustrations for me in training, you know, was that I know I had a week back. It was mm -hmm. so obvious because so my obvious. front squat and my deadlift were the same number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that like I could tell that just by looking at a piece of paper with numbers on it. And I could say Clearly, that ratio is just mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. That's wrong. If I was to do more general training to bring my back strength up, mm -hmm. maybe I would be able to improve my general strength mm -hmm. for, you know, for my back and allow that, you know, that yeah. would allow me to do more hang snatches. Yeah. And I could train the hang snatch and build my transition better, you know, and so on and so forth. So there's all these conclusions you can make from seeing data in mm -hmm. front of you and say, oh, like, look at how weird these are compared yeah. to what good lifters are. Yeah. How do you correct that? And what does that tell us? Yeah. Right? So it's a closed system yeah. because we don't have the ability in a in a, an AI app to look at a person, you know, um, and and you say, oh, this person's doing that. I'm a coach, I can I can decipher. Mm -hmm. But with a closed system, we can take all that data that we have, and even the data we don't have, it, you know, we can gather that mm -hmm. data later on down the road, but we can take that data and say, what what can we infer from these things? Yeah. Right? What patterns do we know exist? You know, historically with these things, people who, you know, front squat 40 kilos more than they deadlift mm. probably have a week back. Right. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a yeah. good place to put your money. Um, and then what do we do? What is that going to infer down the road? Yeah. Right. And there's very simple ones like, oh, if your power snatch is weak, mm -hmm. snatch is, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you need more power. Right. Yeah. That's one layer of one. And for connection. someone like me, okay, your legs are weak. Maybe we don't just give you back squats constantly because your back is going right. to do the work and you're really not going to train your legs a huge amount. Right. Well, that's a good example too, right? Like the system will create a program where you've got weak legs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's the general component of, of improving your clean. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, what is the right amount of training volume in your, in your mm -hmm. squat to include in the initial phase of training, you know, in, in the hypertrophy mm -hmm. phase, the strength phase? And the peaking phase, and how does that volume transition and change from, you know, hypertrophy to strength mm -hmm. to peaking? There should be a subtle change because it's it's a non-specific exercise, right? right? It's not 100% correlated like your mm -hmm. clean is. So we take that information and say, how do we, you know, distill this down over the course of training cycle? How do we adjust volume? How do we titrate in more cleans? Mm -hmm. What way do we titrate them in, yeah. right? Are you going to do just cleans or does the second pull need work? Should we yeah, do more yeah. block cleans? Mm -hmm. Where do those belong in the training cycle? Mm -hmm. And then again, what's the appropriate loading for these things, yeah. right? How do we actually apply enough training stimulus in, in a week or in a month to actually generate results? Yeah. And then how do we manage it all in a, in you know a, a week to week or yeah. day to day or month to month system yeah. so that we don't end up in a place where it's like, well, just do fucking block cleans as hard as you can right, all the time right, yeah. and do squats as hard as you can all the time. Yeah. Oh, but then at the end of the cycle, your snatch sucks. Yeah. Right. And it, you know, what I think is so great is it can, it doesn't just look at these are the strength deficits that you might have and, and work on those. It, it can infer technical right. problems. Like obviously, you know, we're going to have a group, people who are on the app will be able to be in a group and you'll yeah. be on there. I'll be on there. We'll have some other coaches on there providing feedback, but it's also going to be that, you know, you've almost created a, I, I'm going to say it wrong and then you can just make it sound better, but <laughs> like a, uh, an exercise correlation to the snatch for other exercises that allow you to work out based on these other exercises, which part of the snatch is weak, what that might mean technically, and then have a, a hierarchical list of exercises to then attack that specific yeah. weakness. Yeah, you, you basically have, you know, in my coaching, when I got to a point too where I was like, why am I make the decisions I make? And that's hard for a lot of coaches to to really, in a lot of things, is like, why am I making these decisions? Mm -hmm. And the process of building this over the years has been brutal in the sense that like, you have to really assess like, am I coaching people or am I like, am I actually process oriented here? Am I developing systems that yeah, work or yeah. am I just, you know guessing yeah. oh i've seen a lot of guys do that with their feet so like mm -hmm. this is a thing you do mm -hmm. and so getting to the point where you can definitively say this is most likely the probability of this being the issue mm -hmm. is highest right um 
And again, it always comes back to what are the things that we are, that are undeniable, right? We can look at the phases, the phasic structure of the lift, all seven phases of the snatch, mm-hmm. and we can isolate different exercise components that address each phase. Yeah. And then we can look at each phase and, and decompose it and say, which ones of these phases, based on what information we have, is most likely weakest? What does it tell right. us about their technical model, right? What does it tell us about the way they move? Mm-hmm. We can, we can draw conclusions from those things. And it's something you can do as a coach when you look at somebody if you're experienced. It's yeah. 20 years of coaching, you watch but again, somebody. You do, it's not like any coach can do that. Right. Like I know plenty of coaches who they did something like, okay, you're, they would look at me and they go, okay, your hips are shooting back when you squat. That means you've got a weak back. Right. And it's like, or am I loading my back because i got weak legs? Right. And like with someone like you, you don't load your back. It's not because you have a weak back. Well, it is because you've got, but you, because you've got strong yeah, legs. And coaches back. will get it wrong. But yeah, <laughs> people will get it wrong. Like, so no, it's, it's not like coaches can just do this on the fly. It's like good coaches can do right. this. You can do this. I was getting there. You know, there are coaches out there, who, but not everyone is going to yeah. necessarily do that. Well, it's also your bias, right? You, yeah. you, you as a coach, I the same thing. I watch something and I fucking desperately want my answer to be right. Yeah. And so rather than look for what is the data telling Bell me, squats. yeah, I, I, yeah, I look for what is, what is, uh, what is right. You know, what is like, what is objectively, this is actually probably yeah, more right. Yeah. And, you know, you can do it, but the, the detail, right? The, you need something much more capable of actually sorting through huge amounts of, mm-hmm. you know, information and drawing conclusions from it. And then assessing it as you progress through the cycle, as things change, the program should adapt, yeah. right? So not only are you, like, your cycle that you start out with will look different by the end of it, mm-hmm. but based on the fact that you you, you record your ratings, you, you adjust and give feedback and you have this uh, responsive programming happening day to day, you also have a program that's morphing and changing as your strengths and weaknesses are changing and adapting. And it's driving you towards ultimately, you know, the end of the cycle, yeah. but it's doing it in a way that is, is proactive like a coach would be. Mm-hmm. You're getting better at hang snatches. That means we're correcting that. That yeah. means that some of these other things could be adjusted. Yeah. Right. Now we start to drive this up. Now we start to move that. You know, if you were to do this, this, if you were to do an AI program to the app, yeah, four times through, it would be probably if it's the exact same program, right? Mm-hmm. It would be different every time. Yeah, and but, your yeah, results yeah. would be better every time yeah, because yeah. you're going through and it's adapting, and the way you train, the the quality of your lifting mm-hmm. initially the first time is going to be very different the second and yeah. third, and so yeah. the adaptations are going to be different. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's something that needs to be gotten across is that you know historically, you know, I have done in the past. You probably did, but it was more in my era of weightlifting, I suppose, where you would just do a generic program. Right. Like you would follow, and like I'm really not calling anyone out because I, I got great results. But like yeah. I might try a Travis Mash program, and I do it once, and I might get results. Sometimes I got good results in the squat, then I do another one, and maybe not. Or and I was hopping around programs, and I was always told by coaches who knew a lot, like you have to stay with someone yeah. so that we can look at what you did, make one change observe the outcome difference yeah. and then know if that change was worth doing or not instead of just hopping around. And this is this is a system that grows with you. It's yeah. not something... You could jump on and do it for 12 weeks and you're going to do great because it's individualized to you and it changes and it optimizes and it's you know responsive or whatever. But this is something that can be with you throughout a career because it's going to learn more about you. It's also going to learn more about other people who are similar to you mm-hmm and get better at its own decision making almost and sort of continually reassess your technical model your strength biases and yeah and just and optimize for you over time and become the best program for you almost as long as you stay with it right and and the the major benefit too is that we've now given ourselves a platform yeah this is where it didn't exist before it's like my my method of coaching you know the lifters i coach was like a google doc and yeah, yeah like that's that was me i was excel and then i upgraded to google Docs. yeah yeah and some would some would call that a downgrade but yeah. uh <laughs> yeah. um the like that's awesome you got a google doc but what happens when you're 
coaching logic starts to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's say you meet a different coach. This happened to me. Every time I ended up doing better was after I spoke to coaches that Mm -hmm. I saw, hey, they were better than me. They've done something I haven't done. Mm -hmm. And take that information and implement it. And yeah, you could do it with one or two people, but now we have a platform that as we, as coaches and as, you know, basically instructors to this Mm. can look and say, oh, hey, like the way these guys are doing something, that makes sense. Right. I like this. There's fundamentals that aren't going to change, but there's also a lot that just gets to grow and and gets to change. And also you can say, you know, hey, these things, we just find that they don't do what we thought they did. Right. We're we're getting rid of that. We're moving it. Yeah. Um, Which to me is like... It's the ultimate platform. It's the ultimate way to develop and and you know create training programs for people. Yeah. Right. It's it's immersive. It's responsive. It's principle based, and you're setting up yourself to be in a position where, you know, down the road the program will be better than it was three months ago. Mm-hmm. Right. Six months ago. Yeah. I'm I'm more excited actually to wonder where it's going to be in like two years. Yes. Yeah. What what it can do as far as like being able to identify and address things that we have great data on. There are things about the future of the app that we've spoken about which we yeah. shouldn't mention now, but are so mind blown. Yeah. The idea of doing them and yeah. the different the different avenues we can go down with it. But yeah, that's very yeah, exciting. I mean, I I feel like you know there comes a time where there's there's always a platform shift through our technology. There are platform shifts. There are things you know. I'm not saying we're like the printing press or the, the, the internet, of, of you know what I mean? Like things happen and there are big changes, but this is the biggest change in programming. It's like, I was blown away when I did, did a little poll on Patreon and I asked, how do people get the programming? Is it either I am on a team and I see my coach every mm-hmm. day. And then there are other things like I'd follow a generic online program. I have an online coach who sends me a program and they would look at one video a week or I just write my own stuff. Right. And it was like 15 to 20% was I see a coach in person every day. And so you have this enormous group. And and also this is on Patreon where those people are so much more into weightlifting than if we extrapolated out to the rest of the weightlifting community, it would probably be an even smaller percentage because these are like the hardcore weightlifters. So there are all of these weightlifters out there who are probably training suboptimally to some degree because they're either doing the same program that a thousand other people are doing mm-hmm. and it doesn't take into account for them right anything yeah or they are they do have a coach and there is like intention there to make it individualized which is great and it's and it's by far better than just a template program but there's still a lack of like moment to moment responsiveness uh and you know you just can't do everything as an online coach necessarily you, you, and this the, to me anyway this seems like this is the platform shift it's like this is the future of how this is going to have to be. And there, I can sort of, ha- I genuinely feel like I can hand on heart say, if you're one of the people who isn't on a team where you go and see a coach, this is the best training for you. You know, yeah. it seems, it, I mean, it almost, when I say it, I almost hold back and go, should I say that? But it is, it's just as obvious. This is so far ahead at this point. What's what's cool to me is the, the fact that we have a place to, to start this like this starting point of like building out an actual like shift in the way we we manage and deliver programming mm-hmm. right manage and do programming training um you know like my coach was a coach right like he was a coach in that like we did, he never wrote a thing down ever mm. it was i mean he didn't have to because it was the right. same workout every day but like he didn't write things down because like that wasn't part of it there's yeah. no tracking yeah. um to be able to say, to be able to look at and say, oh, like, look at, like, the actual individual assessment I made of each snatch mm-hmm. or clean injury for the last 10 weeks. Like, what is that telling me, right? Yeah. Like, what is, like, what am I doing? Am I looking at that in retrospect and saying, oh, man, I'm, I'm really fucking shitty. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm doing things badly and it's obvious I need to make some changes. And then doing something with that. And it's very difficult for a coach to actually look back over 10 weeks of snatches and work yeah. out what it is that needs to be changed. Yeah. But if it's sort of, if it's analyzed, you know, by the app, basically by these first principle, you know, perspective of, of training, yeah, like it's able to look at trends and make the correct decisions for you. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. I'm super excited to be partnered with you guys. I'm super excited yeah. to be here and like, yeah, it's yeah. going to be fucking awesome. It's going to be unreal. 
yeah, yeah. we've got a lot of plans. It's, fu- it's funny what you said about, you know, golf was, he didn't write it down and he didn't track things. He just sort of knew he had it in his head. Yeah. That's how I felt with a lot of Glenn stuff. Yeah. And then when I forced myself to write the book, I was like, I'm not just going to write down what he did. I'm going to, I'm going to run the numbers and try and understand right. if and why it worked. And one of the things that he came up with later in his career, he called snakes and ladders. And it's this idea of a way to self auto regulate or self regulate or auto regulate your own intensity in the snatch and clean and jerk. Where if you make a lift, you go up a certain amount. Mm-hmm. If you miss, you come back down. Yeah. And so if you're if you're not feeling great, it's going to put you in the right area very quickly, mm-hmm. and it's going to keep you there. And yep. you're going to be training in the most useful sort of yeah. intensity range. And if you're if you're right there and you're ready to PR, it's going to allow you. And then last week when Nick, who was, he's been following this program, yeah. the AI program for a while, he had one of his first slightly heavier snatch sessions. And I watched him see the same thing where yeah. he didn't know what weight he was going to get to. Yeah. And it was exciting. And I was down there, I was doing my rehab and sort of just watching him and we were, you know, chatting it through and he'd make the lift and he would, but it's not just about whether you make it, it's how you make it. And he'd, he'd put in his intuitive rating of it and then he'd be like, I'll say, I'm going, it's taking me up two kilos. Yeah. You know, and that level of excitement of this app is doing yeah. what Glenn was trying to democratize for his online programming, but couldn't quite get out yeah. and understand. And this does that as just one of its many things that it does yeah. to optimize. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so sick. And it's a cool thing too, because like, you know, it's, it's the idea that you're not just, you're not just like selling somebody mm. words on on a document yeah. or or you know downloading train heroic and and purchasing whatever program is available like those just aren't there's nothing beyond just a suggestion there mm-hmm. right and i guess technically it's a suggestion here yeah. but it's based on yeah. information that you're actually giving it yeah. which is so different it's such a different like paradigm shift in like you know, okay, well, here it is. Like, because like I said, like you could do the, the Glenn thing, right? Which yeah. is a, a initial big idea, right? Which yeah. is like, give someone the tools to understand what to do. Yeah, because yeah. Glenn can say, hey, train in an optimal intensity for this workout. Mm-hmm. Always try to be optimal. Yeah. And if you're, you know, I mean, I was going to say if you're Donnie, Donnie would just go super heavy. But yeah. like, if you're, if you're Donnie on the right day, like you're going to do great training. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, you're yeah. going to be like oh, yeah. hitting everything. You're going to bounce a little bit slow as whatever. Um, but like you have to develop the skill of learning how to assess yourself mm-hmm. in order for that to work right yeah. and having the discipline to follow what's yeah. there. Because if you have no program on paper and you have a coach who's, you know, was in Vietnam twice, very willingly, who wants to just <laughs> destroy everything in front of him, like every single opportunity, it looks like a good lift. Like, you know, I, yeah, you only pressed it out on one arm though. So yeah. like go up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's, <laughs> that to me is the most exciting, like, we finally have a system that is like really successful at doing this yeah, and intuitive, very intuitive. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, I've always tried to put myself in the center of weightlifting as much as possible. And then do as, you are. well, you know, <laughs> not, as in like, I want to be in the, I want to be in the back room. I want to be, I want to be interviewing people. I want to be a place where people can go right. to, to learn about, learn more about the sport and just work as hard as I can to do that. And then, you know, I followed you for so long. You know, I flew out to California just to spend time with you two years ago. And even then, it was two and a half years ago, you were talking about this idea. Yeah. Like you've been thinking about it. And then to be at a point now where you then reached out and you said, this is what I've been working on. I've spent so much time and money building <laughs> this thing. Yeah. And... I want to do it with someone else who's got a little bit of infrastructure and we really take this thing to the next level for you to then ask me was like a moment where I remember going home and being like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, this is so cool. Max wants to come and, you know, work with weightlifting house. Like the fact that you're sat there with a weightlifting house t-shirt, it's like, you asked me well, the other day, welcome. like, when you're did, welcome, Seth. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> when did weightlifting house start? You're like, did it start in your bedroom? It's like, it did. And now here we are. Yeah. And we're genuinely about to make, the biggest impact on the sport that I could ever hope to make. Yeah. At least up to this point, you know, I just think, I just think as a, as a partnership, it's going to be unparalleled. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I'm super excited. Yeah. I can't wait. Uh, do we want to cover anything else or should we just 
rat up there and tell people to wait for the next few weeks. Yeah, I guess April. for the next. Early April, that's when it's going to be. Um, we have a date in mind now, but mm-hmm. it's currently February. As in, like, we're currently in February. So I don't want to give you the exact date that we think it's releasing on yeah. because you don't know what can happen over the next, you know, month, month and a half or whatever. But yeah, if the last two years has taught us anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so all I'm going to say is April. If you want to learn more, there'll be a link just down below. You can put your email address in and we'll sort of drip feed you a little bit more information. Make sure that you're able to sign up first when we do release the weightlifting AI app. There'll be some level of, you know, some kind of perk if you're in the first 100, 200, whatever we go yeah, for yeah. people. So, you know, being on that list is going to be valuable if you want to have a little extra on top of everything. Uh, but if you're like I was, I am, Max was throughout his career and you desperately just want to train, train smarter, um, see results, you know, this is, there has never been a better position as a general weightlifter mm-hmm. to improve than the one that you're about to be in come April. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right, guys. Uh, thanks all for tuning in. We're going to produce more of this stuff, me and Max. If you enjoyed it, obviously let us know. Uh, we're very excited for this venture. We hope you guys are too. And we'll catch you all on another episode of the Weightlifting House podcast. Sweet. That's good. Yeah, that was fun. That's I think, good? Okay. Yeah. I think people are going to be... I feel like I rambled for a lot. Like, I kind of was forgetting... <laughs>